this video will be a bit different. Um, I'm going to be trying to do a portrait of a Neanderthal while talking a bit about them uh, and about this kind of reconstruction in general. Um, and the nature of digital art and lots of other forms of art is, uh, is, is such that this will probably not look very good until it's nearly finished uh, and it might not look very good at all. Um, and uh, the process of watching it be done might kind of ruin it. Um, so in editing I'm going to put the finished one here so you can look at it with no lead up uh, and then the rest of this video will be me justifying various choices and just kind of going through it. I'm going to be referencing a picture of my own head and shoulders to get an idea of how the light works because I can't improvise that. I'll edit the picture out in case my uh, disgusting pasty shoulders get me booted off the internet once and for all. Um, firstly I've done a sketch on some paper of how this Neanderthal might turn out. Um, and I'm going to go with an oldish female Neanderthal just because I feel like maybe that's a category that doesn't get done uh, quite as much. Um, and the proportions of this sketch are based on a combination of fossils. The head is vaguely going for Gibraltar 1, which was an adult female Neanderthal. And there's a 3D model of Gibraltar 1 on the Smithsonian website. Um, getting the perspective right was a bit of a pain because the, the sort of camera that you see the model through is quite wide angle. Um, so I had to zoom out, take a screenshot, make it bigger and then trace over that for the skull. And the mandible isn't there so I just had to supplement that with a different one. As far as shoulders go, um, this varies quite a lot in modern humans. So in, in sort of prototypical skeleton diagrams it seems like if you take the height of the head facing forwards, turn that height horizontal, um, then the breadth of the shoulders facing front on is about one and three quarters uh, the head height in men and then something like one and two thirds head height in women. Um, there aren't as many anatomical diagrams of Neanderthal skeletons floating around on the internet um, and I don't know of any journal articles off the top of my head that have them as a kind of composite image. A lot of the time it's just exploded with all the bones separate from each other. Um, Neanderthals had bigger heads than modern humans, even ignoring the fact that they were short, they had bigger heads. So these proportions are slightly different. Um, so for this Smithsonian composite skeleton, which I think is mostly Lafarasi 1, I don't know if I pronounced that right, which had quite a well-preserved pectoral girdle, which is the, um, the clavicles and the scapulae and things like that, the shoulders are almost twice as wide as the head is tall. And this is a male Neanderthal, so we can't necessarily assume that Neanderthals had the same proportional differences as modern humans, um, from males to females. Um, I, I think because shoulder width uh, width varies so much in modern humans, I've gone for very slightly less than the uh, the Farasi male width, and I think even if that's not necessarily the exact average for Neanderthal females, it's bound to fall well within the range of normal. Because we're just doing head and shoulders, the musculature isn't too much of a problem. Um, the main muscles we'll really be able to see are probably the tra trapezius, uh, where it kind of protrudes over the shoulders, some of the smaller muscles around there, and maybe the deltoids. Um, you, can, you can sort of tell a lot about muscle mass uh, in archaeology by how robust the muscle attachments on the skeleton are. Um, and by robust, I mean large and defined rather than smooth and indistinct. Um, and lots of articles either make specific reference to the deltoid attachments on various other bones, like the clavicles being quite large, or they talk about the strength of Neanderthals, which must have been partly calculated using those muscle atta uh, attachments, I think. But there also seems to have been a lot of variation between individuals and between populations, which of course there is in modern humans as well. And that's good for us, because it doesn't require us to be too specific about muscle size, um, which would have depended a lot on the lifestyle of the specific people that you're talking about. We're not saying anything specific about this particular Neanderthal's lifestyle, so I'll make the muscles bigger than those of a modern human, but the same shape, because the muscle attachments don't get, um, or, or don't give the impression of anything else as far as I know. Um, but having said that, the, uh, the whole um, pectoral girdle probably won't be very visible, uh, or, or it will be so, um, if we're focusing on the face, that whole part will be so kind of fuzzy that it, it, you know, the detail probably doesn't matter too much. When you're 
you're doing illustrations of anything extinct, you have to make decisions about soft tissue things which don't necessarily preserve very well. So those are things like hair coverage, hair colour, skin colour, eye colour and things like that. And artistic decisions surrounding that kind of thing are a bit difficult to make because a lot of these things are still being studied. Um, and our understanding of them in Neanderthals is very fragmentary. But the way we socialise with each other means that we pay a huge amount of attention to faces. And these features that we're so unsure about are exactly the things that we would probably focus on if we saw a Neanderthal in person. Um, as well as things like height and musculature and stuff like that, which are more directly determinable from the archaeology. We aren't lucky enough to have found any preserved soft tissue from Neanderthals on the scale that we have with other animals that existed at the same time, like cave lions. Um, that's probably a combination of the fact that 40,000 year old animals preserved in permafrost don't actually turn up all that often um, and that the permafrost these animals turn up in is mostly further north than Neanderthals lived as far as we know so the, mo the, the most northerly Neanderthal site we know of I think is in Wales which seems surprisingly far south given we think of Neanderthals as kind of sort of revenant style ice people that doesn't necessarily mean that we won't find preserved Neanderthal material at some point, um, but it's not surprising that we haven't done yet. So in order to judge these very surface level appearance related things, we have to try and interpret genetic material. And unfortunately, genetic material isn't particularly straightforward to read. Um, so there's no gene with red hair or green eyes written on it. You can have the entire genotype, which is the underlying genetic material that we do have access to for certain individual Neanderthals. But what we see when we look at someone is the phenotype, the large scale sort of surface level realization of that genetic material. Um, so it's very hard to take the genotype and use it to reconstruct the phenotype, especially because in the process of the genotype being expressed as the phenotype, all kinds of environmental factors like temperature, and skeletal trauma you might have experienced as a child or what you eat and things like that can all have effects that are hard to predict. Um, but there's a lot of recent work on predicting these things from genetic material in modern human populations and some of those methods are accurate enough to be used in legal cases and things like that. Um, and the way they work is by isolating correlations between particular variants of nucleotides and particular eye hair or skin colours. So in other words by saying people in our sample that had this combination of nucleotide variants almost all had this hair colour, therefore you can use this to predict the hair colour of an unknown person. And that method seems to work with slightly earlier than modern populations as well. Um, but it's, it's, it's harder to test whether these methods are as effective when used on Neanderthal DNA because we don't have any test subjects, we don't have any Neanderthals of known skin, hair and eye colour to check that the nucleotide variants we use to predict these things in modern humans are as reliable when used on Neanderthals. My instinct has always been that the populations that we call Neanderthals existed for twice as long as modern humans have so far, and they probably had a very wide range of skin, hair and eye colours, uh, and there are studies that agree with that. So one of those studies talks about an allele um, that has a role in regulating pigmentation in lots of vertebrate species, including humans and Neanderthals, and it finds that Neanderthals probably had va uh, varying pigmentation levels, potentially on the same scale as modern human populations do but that's tentative, I think. Um, uh, come to th I think that may, may actually have been the paper that established that some Neanderthals might have had red hair, but I'll correct myself on screen if I'm wrong. A slightly more recent study in the American Journal of Human Biology applied the same kind of analysis as I described before to three Neanderthal individuals. Um, and that analysis suggested that they had, they all had darker skin and brown eyes uh, and that two had dark brown hair and one had red hair. And they did the same analysis on modern humans with known characteristics and got them largely right, although I think some characteristics threw up more mistakes than others. So with that in mind, I've gone for a relatively light skin tone in this instance and hair that's kind of reddish brown, uh, but with the stipulation that this was just one person of presumably hundreds of thousands. The hairstyle I'm going for is completely made up. Um, primate species all groom themselves on some level and given some of the other things Neanderthals were capable of I really don't see why they wouldn't have done things with their hair um, although the specifics of that would be different from culture to culture so that aspect of this portrait is completely made up semi influenced by the fact that I'm not fantastic at drawing hair so I didn't want to do too much of it. When I'm drawing portraits like this I tend to go more detailed in a kind of 
sort of plane around the eyes and nose, almost as if that's the bit that's kind of in focus and there's a narrow depth of field around there. Um, and then the details lost a little bit as you get further away from the viewer, but that requires me to, to do eyes, which is another thing I'm not very good at making look spot on, uh, unless I cheat somehow. Um, I think I, I kind of make them look passable, but I want, I want them to be the focus of the realism, and a lot of the time that just doesn't come across, and I think this is one of the cases where it, it, it hasn't come across very well. And I'm also giving the person an injured ear for interest's sake, although the, the lack of detail towards the back of the image allows me to get away with not knowing how ear injuries actually happen or how they heal. Um, so I'm sure somebody will, will point out an error with that. I, I really, the patterns in ears are something that I, I I, I can do them if they're side on because I, I can just use somebody else's ear for reference but if they're you know if, if it's a face front on and you can see the ear kind of yeah I, I really can't do the patterns then um, I need to practice that I'm at the point that I don't know how much better it's going to get uh, I, I think when I look at it from a distance it looks quite flat but then when I look at it closer up it looks relatively all right and I think that's probably because it's supposed to be kind of daylight but with cloud cover um, or at least that's how it was in the reference picture I took and I find if there's harsh light then it tends to look better from further away um, I suppose just because there's more variation in color but if I turn the contrast up it just looks horrible so um, I think another thing is the eyes are a bit not aligned very well with each other but we'll put that down to some kind of injury that the Neanderthal had when, when she was a child um, and the eyes also don't look as realistic as they could, but I might try to add a bit of detail and just show an improved version in a later video. But thank you very much for watching this um, slightly left field video. Hopefully I didn't get too much of the genetic stuff wrong, but do check the description because I'll, I'll credit anyone that, um, that corrects me on anything. But yeah, thank you very much for watching and I will talk to you soon.